take our Bibles this morning, please. We'll turn to 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Great to see you here for Sunday school. And uh, pray for one another. As I mentioned, I know there are folks, some who are out traveling this week, some who are ill, others who are quarantined, just a lot of different scenarios and situations. And uh, so let's pray for one another. And if, if you notice that somebody isn't here, I encourage you to reach out to them some form, some fashion. Just let them know you care about them. Uh, text, letter, call, email, something just to let them know you're thinking about them. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. Last week uh, we saw in 1 Samuel 1 that Hannah could not have children and that her husband Elkanah, uh, he didn't really understand uh, her burden. And you know, there are times you'll have a burden that nobody but God can really fully understand your burden. And uh, El El Elkanah didn't get it. We see 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 8, when she was weeping because Elkanah's other wife, Penina, would, would mock and ridicule Hannah because she couldn't have children. Uh, that Elkanah, he said to her in verse 8, he said, why, Hannah, why weepest thou, and why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? Am not I better to thee than ten sons? He didn't get it. He didn't understand her burden. And so she is praying, she's weeping, and she comes to the Lord, verse 10, chapter 1, in bitterness of soul, and prayed unto the Lord, and wept sore, and she vowed a vow. And remember, when you vow a vow to the Lord, defer not to pay it. If you promise God something, make sure you follow through on it. And she promised the Lord. She said, if thou wilt, verse 11, indeed, look on the affliction of thine handmaid, and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thine handmaid a man-child. Then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. He would be a Nazarite unto the Lord. And uh, verse 12, notice we see that Eli lacked wisdom, and we're going to see that even more in the next chapter. He was uh, the spiritual leader, but he very much lacked wisdom. In fact, verse 12, it says that he saw her praying, and she wasn't vocalizing her prayer. She was mouthing these words to the Lord. And when he saw her, instead of assuming this is a heartbroken person who needs some help, he assumed the worst. He assumed that she was drunk, that she was there just acting out. And he said to her, verse 14, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. Verse 15, I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint... And grief have I spoken hitherto. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. And the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And you find that uh, Hannah uh, rejoices because her prayer is going to be answered. And she does have a son. And uh, verse, uh, notice uh, verse 21. It says, And the man of Cana and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But... Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, until he's done uh, nursing. And then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide forever. And Elkanah her husband said unto her, Do what seemeth thee good, tarry until thou have weaned him. Only the Lord establish his word. He, make sure you keep your word. Let the, the Lord promised, he fulfilled his promise, you fulfill your promise. So the woman abode and gave her son suck until she weaned him. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And they slew a bullock and brought the child to Eli. So they offered a burnt offering. And she said, O my Lord, as thy soul liveth, my Lord, I am the woman that stood by thee here praying unto the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord hath given me my petition, which I asked of him. By the way, parents, uh, imagine, and there are folks who are praying for children. They want children. Make sure that once you have your children, that you're praying for them with that same intensity, that same fervor. Keep praying for your children. Verse 28, she says, Therefore also the Lord answered my petition. Verse 28, Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he liveth, he shall be lent to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. And let's pray. Lord, I pray that as we... Continue into chapter 2, Lord, that you will again not just teach us the history, not just teach us facts about these folks, but Holy Spirit, please apply your word to us today. Give us what we need. You know the needs in this room. Meet our needs. Please, through your word, in Jesus' name, amen. Chapter 2, Hannah begins by rejoicing in the Lord. She is, uh, she is praying, but notice this isn't a song, it's a prayer. 
She's praying this. But this is in Scripture. She prays this, and, and this becomes known even to us in our day, what Hannah prayed. Now, I want you to see her prayer. It says, And Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. And by the way, who is the human instrument God used to pen these words down? It was Samuel, her son, who penned these words down. And so he knows here what, uh, what the Lord has put into Hannah's heart. And what you'll find interesting is Hannah's prayer is very similar to when Mary found out she was going to give birth to Jesus. And it's very similar to Elizabeth when she found out she was going to give birth to John the Baptist. And so here, 1 Samuel chapter 2, Hannah's rejoicing. She's praying with praise to the Lord. And in verses 1 and 2, what is her focus? Her focus is on the Lord's salvation, the Lord's holiness, and the Lord's strength. In fact, go to Psalm 61, please. Look at Psalm 61 and uh, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 61, look at verses 1 through 4. And uh, her heart was broken. She, she could not, uh, she, she had no, uh, she had to look to the Lord for her strength. She had no strength in and of herself because of the oppression of Penina and because of her broken heart. And notice when she's praying, she says in verse uh, 2, Neither is there any rock like our God. And look at Psalm 61, verse 1. The psalmist writes, Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. When your heart's overwhelmed, go to the Lord. As I mentioned last week, our hope is in the Lord. Uh, when there's a situation that's beyond your control, you rest upon your rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 3, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings Selah. So Hannah's prayer, her focus is on the Lord's salvation, his holiness, his strength. Notice what her focus is next. Go back to 1 Samuel 2, verse 3. She says, talk no more so exceedingly, exceeding proudly. Well, who's she talking about here? Probably Penina, the other wife who mocked her every time and just made her burden more grievous. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. And what you're going to see in the next few verses, Hannah recognizes God's power, number one, not just to know your situation. You say, well, God, God doesn't, uh, you know, I, I don't know if anybody really knows what I'm going through. Well, God does. Well, I don't know if anybody really knows how this person treated me. God does. God knows. And here, she recognizes that. He is a God of knowledge, but notice She's also going to recognize that God can change any circumstance. And that's what these next verses are about. She, he, she prays, talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken. So he reverses the mighty men's strength and power. And they that stumbled are girded with strength. So the ones who were stumbling are now strong. Verse 5, they that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. In all of these situations, God is reversing courses. Verse 6, the Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. Go with me to James chapter 4, would you please? And I want to remind you as we turn here to James 4 uh, what the Lord said to Abram. He said, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Anything. Is there any situation God cannot reverse? There isn't. Uh, and this is what Hannah is recognizing, that even though she had gone through suffering and struggle, that she recognized God's knowledge, that God know, knew her situation, and that God had the power to change any 
circumstance. And just like the Lord said to Abram, is there anything too hard for the Lord? And uh, notice here in James 4, here's the key. Th this really is the key. And uh, we're going to look at this more at the 11 o'clock hour. Uh, but there's one thing God won't tolerate. There's one thing God, well, there's a lot of things, but there's one especially you see over and over and over and over in the Bible that God, don't miss this, that God will not work with. He won't. And that's pride. If you look at James chapter 4, verse 6, it says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. If you look in 1 Samuel 2, that's what Hannah is saying. She said in verse 3, Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. She's thinking of Penina, who's been with arrogancy and pride just uh, attacking her and, and discouraging her. Well, James 4 says this, and, and by the way, with somebody who lives in pride and arrogancy, they may enjoy that power, that, that manipulation for a while, but ultimately there's a reckoning with God. God won't put up with pride. He won't. It doesn't matter who it's in, by the way. It doesn't matter if it's a lost person or a child of God. It doesn't matter. He won't tolerate pride. He won't allow it to stay. And if we don't humble ourselves, here's an important thing to remember. If we don't humble ourselves, God will humble us. The Bible says that's very clear throughout many teachings in Scripture. But look at James 4, 6. It says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What does submit mean? It means to put yourself under God's mission. You may have your own mission. God wants you to go under his mission. He wants you to obey him. Verse 8, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. What did Hannah do? She humbled herself to the Lord. She came to the Lord brokenhearted, humbly, saying, Lord, please intervene. And again, th this wasn't a quick answer. You see, this happened year by year. I don't know how many years. It doesn't really tell us how many years this happened where they went up to sacrifice and Penina would mock Hannah. It doesn't tell us, but it happened over a period of time. But Hannah, brokenhearted, came to the Lord, and the Lord answered in his timing. The Lord knows your situation, and he can reverse any circumstance. Do you believe that this morning? Do you believe he can reverse any circumstance? And by the way, notice again, if you look at uh, what we just read in her prayer, he can take a good circumstance and turn it worse. And he does that sometimes. Some people say, God would never allow that. Oh, he does. We see it many times. On the other hand, he can take a bad circumstance and make it better. He can reverse any circumstance. And I want you to see Psalm 113. This particularly applies to Hannah's situation. Look at Psalm 113. Verse 7, it says, He raiseth up the poor out of the dust, and lifteth the needy out of the dunghill, that he may set him with princes, even with the princes of his people. I mean, that sounds very familiar to what she just prayed. Now look at verse 9. He maketh the barren woman to keep house, and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. You know, I, I believe in science, and let me s explain what I mean by that. Uh, the Lord created science. He created things that uh, we can observe, uh, that can be reproduced, that we can say, yes, this is how certain things work. God created that. But I want to remind you that God doesn't do everything in the realm of science. He does many things in the realm of the supernatural. Uh, be careful. Be very careful. I've noticed this as a trend among believers, that believers feel they have to prove everything from God's word through science. Can I tell you, there's some things God does you're not going to prove through science because they're supernatural. God, God isn't, isn't uh, bound necessarily. He can use his laws, but he's not necessarily bound by that. God is in control of all of these things. And so we see in 1 Samuel 2, he can reverse any situation. He knows your situation. He can reverse any situation. And in Hannah's case, he does. He gives her a child, Samuel, and she dedicates him to the Lord. Go back to 1 Samuel 2. At the end of her prayer, she not only has recognized God's salvation, and I want you to see her prayer, her thanksgiving, her focus, isn't so much on the gift God has given her. It's not so much on the gift, but it's on the giver. You know, if God 
didn't give you what you asked for, would you still focus on he who has given you everything? Here, Hannah's focus isn't so much on the gift. It's on the one who gave the gift. It's on the Lord. And so uh, notice next what she prays, verse 9. She recognizes God's eternal authority, his eternal authority. In fact, we find here a very unique statement, not unique, but a, 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 an important statement. Verse 9, it says, He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness, for by strength shall no man prevail. Did you notice that? It's not by strength we prevail, it's by God's blessing. The Lord doesn't take pleasure, the Bible says, in the legs of a man, meaning he, he doesn't take pleasure in human strength, human power, but he loves it when people depend on him. He loves it when people look to him for help, look to him for strength. Verse 10, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth. Verse 10 is a, is a prophetic verse. It's talking about end times. It is. It's, yes, it applies to a whole lot of things in between there and here and the end. But it's talking about in the end. Notice when it says... The Lord, uh, out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his, what's the next word? King. Let me ask you a question. Did Israel have a human king at this time? They didn't. They didn't have a human king. They, they were in the last of the judges. They had Eli, and they're about to have Samuel. They didn't have a human king, but so why is Hannah praying about a king? Well, because this isn't, this isn't, something she conjured up out of her own heart. These are the words of God. God put this in Hannah's heart. Hannah prays this. Samuel records this. It says, He shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now, there are many people in the Bible who were anointed. Three groups of people. Prophets were anointed. You think of Elijah who went and anointed Elisha to be the next prophet. Priests were anointed. Kings were anointed. There's only one person who fulfills all three. Prophet, priest, king, anointed. There's only one who is the anointed one. And who is that? That's Jesus the Christ. Christ means anointed one. Christ means Messiah. Right here. Who is this verse talking about ultimately? It's talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus, Messiah, Jesus, the anointed one. And so, again, I want to remind us as we study any book of the Bible that it all, no matter what the story is about, it all centers on ultimately and points to Jesus Christ. Every bit of it does. And so uh, here, again, Hannah in her prayer, she recognizes God's salvation, his holiness, his strength, his knowledge, his power to change any circumstance his authority. And again, her focus is not on the gift, but it's on the one who gave the gift. Now, notice next, 1 Samuel chapter 2, we're going to see the wickedness of Eli's sons, the wickedness of his sons. Verse 12, it says, now the sons of Eli. Now, so remember, Samuel's a little child. He's been brought here to serve with Eli, alongside Eli's sons. They are also in spiritual leadership, but they are wicked men. Notice verse 12, it says, Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came. Now stop right here. Eli and his sons had a custom which was not what God had commanded them to do. God had very clearly told them what they were to do. And this is very significant. Now, follow with me just for a minute here. The Bible says in Leviticus 19.5, it says, And if he offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, ye shall offer it at your own will. That's important to remember. A peace offering in the Bible was not to make peace with God. It was a willing offering. Only one time a year was it commanded, but the rest of the time it was a willing offering that you brought because you were at peace with God, because you were expressing gratitude. It was like it was an offering. It was giving of yourself to the Lord. And what would happen is you'd offer that sacrifice. You would eat it there with your family, your friends. You'd enjoy it and praise the Lord for it. Part of it would be offered on the altar. Part of it, the priest who offered it would eat himself as well. 
And so it, it was an offering. It was supposed to be a blessing. It, it's like when you give God something that he doesn't command you to give, but you from your own heart just say, you know what, I want to give this to the Lord. That's what a peace offering was supposed to be. But Eli's sons had so corrupted this process that people began to despise the offering of the Lord. It's like a preacher who, if the preacher says, let's raise funds, let's raise funds, let's raise funds for God, for God, for God. And then he goes and buys a yacht and has a nine-hole golf course in his yard. Say, is this for God? You know, that kind of makes you gun shy. kind of makes you say, I don't know if I want to give. When we really should want to give, we should want to give. We should want to offer to the Lord. But when people in places of spiritual leadership abuse that, then it makes you not want to give. And that's what was happening with Eli and his sons. They, they had a specific part that they were supposed to receive. In fact, let's go here. Look at Leviticus chapter 7. I just want you to see that God very clearly designated which cut of meat they should have for their meal. Look at Leviticus 7, verse 28. And there are other, many other verses in Leviticus we could go to, but these are, this is the gist of all this. Look at Leviticus 7, 28. It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, He that offereth the sacrifice of his peace offerings unto the Lord shall bring his oblation unto the Lord of the sacrifice of his peace offerings. His own hands shall bring the offerings of the Lord made by fire, the fat with the breast it shall he bring, that the breast may be waved for a wave offering before the Lord. And the priest shall burn the fat upon the altar. Remember, the fat is the Lord. You may remember hearing that. Uh, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his sons. And the right shoulder shall ye give unto the priest for an heave offering of the sacrifices of your peace offerings. He among the sons of Aaron that offereth the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right shoulder for his part. For the wave breast and the heave shoulder have I taken of the children of Israel from off the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them unto Aaron the priest and unto his sons by a statute forever from among the children of Israel. This is the portion of the anointing of Aaron and of the anointing of his sons out of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. So the priests were to have a part. They were to live of the altar. So there's nothing wrong with that. But God had told them specifically what they were to have. Uh, again, notice uh, verse 35 of the anointing of his sons out of the offerings of the Lord made by fire in the day when he presented them to minister unto the Lord in the priest's office, which the Lord commanded to be given them of the children of Israel. So they were commanded to receive certain offerings for their work. There's nothing wrong with that. They were to live of the altar, as the Bible says. But what Eli and his sons were doing, go back to 1 Samuel 2, they weren't satisfied with what God was giving them. They wanted more. And as a matter of fact, we're going to see that the Lord later on rebukes Eli. He says, you've made yourself fat with the offerings of God's people. He said, you, you have gone beyond what I've given you. You've taken that which doesn't belong to you. And you've made yourself fat with those offerings. And so notice 1 Samuel chapter 2, uh, verse 12. Again, it says, the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. Verse 13, the priest's custom with the people was... That when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest. For he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. We don't want it cooked. We want it raw. Give it to us. Verse 16. And if any man said unto him, let them not fail to burn the fat presently. Hey, the fat's the Lord's. Make sure, make sure what I'm trying to give to the Lord gets to the Lord. Uh, it, again, it'd be like somebody giving through church and saying, hey, make sure what I've given to the work goes to the work. Uh, notice. Give flesh, uh, verse 16, let them not fail to burn the fat presently and then take as much as thy soul desireth. Then he would answer him, nay, but thou shalt give it me now. And if not, I will take it by force. No, you give me what I want. I'm, I'm in charge here. You give me what I want. And if you don't give to me, I'm going to take it from you. This is the way Eli and his sons were operating the work of the Lord. Is it any wonder people began to despise 
serving and offering offerings to the Lord. Verse 17, wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Why? Because they were dealing with crooked spiritual leaders. They were dealing with wicked spiritual leaders who were there to take for themselves whatever they wanted instead of being satisfied with what God had given to them. And, and by the way, this is so important for us to understand. It's a woe unto any man or woman in any place of spiritual leadership, be it a pastor, be it an evangelist, be it a parent, doesn't matter. Any place of spiritual leader, if you cause people to despise the worship of God because of your own wickedness and sin, you need to be careful. You need to be so careful in any area of spiritual leadership that you don't cross over boundaries that God has established. Well, I want you to notice that in the middle of that, it wasn't just their wickedness, disobeying the Lord with the sacrifices, but it was also their immorality. If you look at verse 22, it says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Not only did they take offerings that didn't belong to them, they were taking to themselves women that didn't belong to them. That they were despising the worship of the Lord. They were bringing a blot upon the name of the Lord. And uh, I want you to notice, though, in the middle of all that, you know, you say, boy, the culture's bad. How could anybody serve the Lord? In the middle of that culture, Samuel was still faithful to the Lord. You see, what the culture does doesn't determine whether you can or can't be faithful. You can be faithful to the Lord. Uh, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord in a generation where God was going to destroy the whole earth with a flood. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I think of Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. He is taken away as a captive to Babylon. But what did he do? The Bible says he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. What does that mean, he purposed in his heart? It means he made a decision before he had to make a decision. By the way, that's so important to do. Make a decision before you're confronted with the decision. So then it's easy. Then you just you just say, no, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to obey the Lord. Just make the decision before it's time. By the way, that will also keep you away from a lot of temptations because you'll avoid things you should avoid. But here, the wickedness of Eli's sons was very great. But Samuel's service was sincere to the Lord. Look at verse 18. In the middle of all that, it says, but Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child girded with a linen ephod. He was, even as a child, he was working, serving the Lord. And parents, let me encourage you. Don't, don't encourage, don't tell your kids, well, when you grow up, you need to serve the Lord. No, as a child, they need to serve the Lord. As a child, they need to work for the Lord. They need to grow into what they should be as a child. Verse 19, notice his mother's encouragement along those lines. Verse 19 you don't find his mother saying, well, I wish you were back with me. No, she's encouraging him. You do what God's called you to do. Verse 19, moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, the Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto their own house, uh, unto their own home. And by the way, notice, God blessed Hannah beyond Samuel, she had many more children. Verse 21, and the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child Samuel grew before the Lord. That's very similar to what it says about Jesus in Luke chapter 2 when it says that he grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Uh, Samuel is growing before the Lord. The Lord has his eye upon Samuel. I want you to notice next, number four, Eli's lax attitude towards his son's sin, his lax attitude. Eli was in a position where he could have done something about his son's sin. He could have, but he didn't. Why? Because he honored, as God said, his sons above the Lord. Parents, one of the greatest mistakes you can make is honor your children above the Lord. Do not honor your children above the Lord. Don't honor your, your spouse above the Lord. Spouses, it's not healthy if you put your spouse above the Lord. Put the Lord first. Both of you, put the Lord first. Put the Lord first, and then things will fall right into place. Put the Lord first. But here Sam, uh, Eli puts his own sons first. He doesn't want to displease them. Well, because he didn't displease them, God's going to kill them. 
Folks, it'd be a whole lot better, parents, if we displeased our children and get them in line than for God to have to get their attention later. It's better for us to get their attention. It's better for us to do what we need to do to get their attention. But Eli had a lackadaisical attitude. As a matter of fact, just look at this verse quickly. We'll see it when we go to 1 Samuel 3. But look at 1 Samuel 3.13. He's talking about Eli. He says, I have told him, I have told Eli, that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth because his sons made themselves vile, notice this, and he restrained them not. He could have done something. He did not have to enable his sons to continue on in their perversion, but he did. He enabled them. He helped them. And because of that, God is going to have to deal with their sons, with his sons. And so notice uh, verse uh, 22. Again, Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel. And how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now it's almost going to seem like Eli is trying to do something. But folks, this is a weak, a weak rebuke. It, it, it's barely a rebuke at all. It, it's almost a na naughty boys, naughty, don't do that. When he had the power to just remove them. He could have removed them. He could have gotten their attention. But instead he's just, boys, straighten up now. They needed more than, boys, straighten up now. And notice... He said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil doings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Let me ask you a question. Is everything Eli is saying correct? It is. So is Eli later rebuked because he didn't say the right things? No, he could have taken action. He could have taken action to stop his sons from what they were doing, but he did not because he valued his sons above the Lord. And notice, he said, If a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. And I want you to notice, notice next, there is judgment pronounced upon Eli's house. Verse 27, it says, And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him? By the way, the answer to all these questions is yes. What God is saying is I've given you every advantage, put you into place of spiritual leadership. But you're despising me is what the Lord's telling him. He says, did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice. He said, you're despising what I've given you. You're not appreciating what I've given you. Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. He said, you weren't satisfied with what I gave you. You wanted something different, something more. Verse 40, or 30, wherefore the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, be it far from me. Don't miss this. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. How do we honor the Lord? By obeying him. How do we despise the Lord? By disobeying. It's very simple. It doesn't matter how we obey or disobey necessarily. The question is, are you obeying the Lord? Are you in obedience to the Lord? We honor the Lord through our obedience, not through our lip service, not through the things we say or the things we feel about the Lord. We honor him by obeying him. Verse 31, behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation and all the wealth which God shall give Israel. And there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart. And all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee that shall come upon thy two sons on Hophni and Phinehas in one day. They shall die, both of them. This is tragic. It didn't have to end this way. It didn't. But Eli, when he had the chance, did not correct his sons when they were young. He also did not restrain them when they were older. He didn't stop them. He could have, and he didn't. He allowed them. And parents, if your children, if you have grown children living in open sin, 
do not enable them in that sin for their benefit. It has nothing to do with who's better than who. or It's for their benefit. Do not enable them in their sin. Don't do it. Love them. And the way you love them is don't enable them to continue in sin. Now notice, the Lord then prophesied that he will raise up a faithful priest. Verse 35, and I will raise me up. A faithful priest. Now in the near term, there's a faithful priest, Samuel. But he is not the complete fulfillment of this verse. He isn't. Uh, because notice, you'll see what he says. I will raise me up a faithful priest. And by the way, there'd be other faithful priests, a few after Samuel. But they're not a f- complete fulfillment of this either. Uh, all of the Bible centers on and points to whom? Jesus Christ. So who do you think this is referring to? It's Jesus Christ. Notice, I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And it shall come to pass that every one that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices that I may eat a piece of bread. So in the near term, yes, Samuel is a partial fulfillment of this, but the total fulfillment of this is the Lord Jesus Christ. And let's end here. Go to Hebrews chapter 2, please. And that's really what the book of Hebrews, a lot of Hebrews, is about. We could look at many passages. I just want to look at a couple. Look at Hebrews chapter 2. And uh, we do have a faithful high priest. We have a high priest who came for us, who literally wasn't wasn't just our high priest, but he was also our offering for sin. Notice Hebrews 2.14, it says, For as much then as the children, that's us, are partakers of flesh and blood, He also, Jesus also himself, likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people, for in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. He's able to come alongside us and help us. And again, there are many other verses in Hebrews. Let's look at one more, or one more passage. Hebrews 4, look at verse 14. Hebrews 4, 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That is ultimately fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a high priest we have. Whatever burden you have, you can bring it to him. You think of Hannah. Her heart was broken. Nobody could understand her broken heart like God. What did she do? She brought her petition to the Lord. And in the Lord's time, he reversed course. He changed her entire situation. And God still, to this day, has the power to change any circumstance. And he has the knowledge. He knows what you're going through. He knows where you're at. And he can do it. He can. Just continue to humble yourself before the Lord. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, we covered so many things in your word today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll apply your truth to our hearts And, Lord, may we remember the things we've heard, Lord, those areas we need to take action. Remind us of those. And, again, Lord, seal your word to our hearts this morning. Bless in the next hour, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.